Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bhagam Radian here at the Air Force Association's annual Airspace Cyber Conference and Trade Show, the number one gathering of U.S. Air Force leaders from around the world coming here uh, at this great convention center just outside the nation's capital. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and we're over here at the Pratt & Whitney Dependable Engine Stand to talk to Chris Johnson, who's the Executive Director uh, for Mobility, uh, as well as uh, Diverse Engines, which I think is a very, very cool uh, title, by the way, Chris. But we're going to talk about the PW800 because you're also overseeing the campaign to re-engine the great B-52 uh, Stratofortress uh, bomber. But bring us up to speed on where this uh, program is right now. Air Force has been working towards this goal for some time. Did a couple of studies to see whether or not it could go four engine. Finally concluded staying with an eight engine uh, configuration is the right way to go for the airplane for aerodynamic control and a whole bunch of other reasons. Tell us a little bit about where the program is uh, right now to bring everybody up to speed on that. Sure. Uh, we're really excited about this. We've been the propulsion partner on the Buff since its inception. So, you know, six and a half decades and we're committed to being there all the way through. So, um, what we would say is that there's never been a better time to re-engine the B-52 than today. We're about four and a half months into a six months integration study with the Air Force and Boeing, where we're looking in depth at you know, what's it take. And what we're learning out of that is, uh, it's just reinforcing what we thought in the beginning. There's never been a better time to re-engine the B-52. And what we're seeing is there'd never be a better engine than the PW-800. So. But but before we get to the attributes of the PW800, so walk us through because um, Boeing, you're, Boeing is working with you guys on the study, but the Air Force is ultimately going to be making the decision. Walk us through the process we're going to go before we get there. Yeah, that's right. So uh, during this integration study, what we've we've been doing the calculations on our side. Boeing's been refining their calculations, and we've been. Uh, basically handling, handing the information back and forth and working closely together and with the Air Force. Um, and it's through that process that we've been able to see those benefits for the engine that the, the Air Force and the DOD has been dreaming about for decades that you referenced. Um, you know, we've been saying 30% fuel burn. What we see out of this is that we can get to 35% fuel burn. That's going to bring a ton of operational benefits, long-term uh, cost savings. Uh, it's a huge benefit. We're, because, because the Air Force's idea is that actually in long-term fuel savings and maintenance savings, you have the TF-33 that are on the jets right now, uh, which uh, is, is not exactly a young engine, uh, newer than the original engines that the airplanes uh, had, which were also uh, Pratt & Whitney uh, units. Um, is there sort of a size of program has that been clear, and I apologize if I don't know this, you know, that hey, we want to spend X amount of money, but here's the amount of money that we feel we're going to reap over the long term. Yep. Um, what I'd say is uh, what the, the Air Force has been saying is that we're going to replace the, uh, the engines with the same capability, same performance, um, and we're going to take advantage, the Air Force is going to take advantage of the life cycle cost benefits. And so that's going to come from fuel burn saving. It's going to come from zero overhauls across the life of the program, between 2030 to 2050 and beyond. And it's going to come from, from uh, easier, lower cost on-wing maintenance. Um, and on top of that, um, what we'd say is that the reason it's never been a better time to re-engine is that you finally got the new generation of engines. That have, This is what has transformed the commercial aerospace industry. So the, the core of this engine um, has transformed the regional jet market uh, with the, the Airbus A220 uh, engine, the Embraer E2 family. Uh, the PW800 uh, is transforming uh, uh, business aviation, so the Gulfstream G500, G600, the Dassault Falcon. Um, all of those engines, all of those aircraft are moving to, to this new fuel efficiency and the whole, uh, all their customers are going there. What that's going to bring is the supply chain that's going to be there for decades. Um, and what is uh, the reason to go with Pratt uh, instead of Rolls? Rolls feels like they've got a great solution to it. You go over to see your uh, General Electric friends, uh, they're pretty confident about the solution that they have. Why do you feel you've got the right engine and what's the advantage you have that they don't? Yeah. We think the PW800 is the right engine uh, because it's got all of the performance of the modern engine and it's got the commercial infrastructure that's going to be there for decades. Um, and, you know, we're the partner that uh, is 100% committed to the Air Force. We've been on this platform uh, since its beginning. We know the mission. We're behind the warfighter. And we want to be there with the B-52 all the way through. Uh, Re-engineering is, is hard. That's why the Air Force has thought so hard about this. And we know this engine will integrate easily. 
Uh, so it's going to make a hard job easy. Uh, at the same time, we've got a lot of great experience uh, integrating this engine onto those platforms that I mentioned. And we know that this is going to be the one that's going to, that the, when the Air Force takes a look at, it's going to give them the benefits that they want. Um, I, you know, one of the things that uh, folks uh, sometimes ask is, uh, because the uh, B-52 is a nuclear-hardened bomber, uh, it has good old-fashioned uh, manual connections between throttles, for example, and engines, whereas almost everybody now is using electronic engine controls in part in order to get that kind of efficiency. Um, does that present any challenges from a nuclear hardening standpoint to have electronics involved uh, in the engine controls, or uh, is that just old-fashioned thinking uh, about the problem? Yeah. Um, from, from the engine perspective and the, the FADEC, I mean, we're able to use the, the commercial off-the-shelf technology. We're able to integrate it uh, easily in. I can't speak to what Boeing's doing on their side, but uh, you know, this engine is, is ready to go. We're ready now, and um, we're working closely with the Air Force and, and Boeing moving forward. Uh, so the question about uh, whether or not you know, your engine controls uh, would be um, you know, in, in the event of a nuclear pulse or, or to be controls on a nuclear hardened bomber, what, would there be any challenge associated with developing that? Like I said, I mean, some of the older generation folks are like, hey, unless you have mechanical linkages, you know, you, there's no way that this system would be compatible. Whereas others argue there's all sorts of ways to, to actually get to solving the problem. Yeah, well, you know, the requirements are set by the Air Force on what they need, but you know, we're very confident that we'll be able to meet whatever they need, like we meet uh, what's needed on uh, all of the modern engines with all of the uh, digital control, which fly into you know, all sorts of places. Right, and, and that's right, because the F-35 has your engine in it, and it's also something that's going to be deploying nuclear weapons. So uh, let, let me ask you one last question, Chris. Um, when is going to be, when is the down-select decision going to be? Like, you know, as you guys, I know that this is still an evolving program, and there, you know, I don't think any of the things, deadlines are hard, but is there a rough idea when contract award would be roughly, and when uh, the Air Force would like to start getting its modified airplane? Yeah, so um, you know, defer to the Air Force on, on exactly when they're timing, but I can tell you they want to move quickly, we want to move quickly. Um, we're expecting that you know, in next year we'll be working on an RFP. Uh, we're expecting that they'll be making a decision next year. Right. That's, that's what we're working to, but I'd look to the Air Force for the official answer. And uh, diverse engines. Uh, I know that there's a lot of engine diversity in your yeah. portfolio. Talk to us about how yeah. uh, that, because I think you were like turbo shafts and other things. Yep. I'm sorry, anybody who watches this program knows how excited I get with like yeah. anything that has turbojet, turbo shaft, or anything else uh, in it. So tell us yeah. where diversity in engines comes from. Yeah, well, I'm just as excited as you are. So the diverse engine portfolio that I manage uh, goes from the turbojet, from the APU uh, uh, side of the business. Um, we do our commercial derivatives from our, our business jet and regional jet market, like the PW800 behind me. Um, and uh, then on the mobility side of the platform, uh, we've got the, the F117 on the C17 right. and the, the PW4062 on the, the tanker. So it's a pretty wide range of, uh, of engines. Lots of stuff to be excited about. You mentioned uh, turbo shafts too. So you know, on the Army side, we're looking at right. uh, you know, what, are the, what are the needs for future vertical lift and how can we help them do what they need to do. Great, Chris Johnson, uh, who is the executive director for uh, mobility and diverse engines. Uh, always a pleasure. Best of luck uh, with the PW800, uh, and we will be watching the B52 re-engineering really closely. Thanks very much, Chris. Right. Thank you.